Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing? Praise the Lord for the choir and the music ministry of First Baptist. You folks are spoiled. I hope you know that, all right? You've got an incredibly talented, wonderful church. And I also want to say this. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, you, your church is not influencing just Effingham County. It's influencing not just the southeastern part of Georgia. Your church has an influence all across our state. You're one of the leading churches in our state convention in many ways. Praise God for First Baptist Rincon. Amen. Can you give glory to God for what he's doing here? And uh, so much is happening because 3,500 churches have decided they want to work together to reach not just Georgia and the 8 million lost people. And so many people are coming to Georgia now, but the 8 million lost people that live here in Georgia, but also around the world. We had just last week had the Southern Baptist Convention uh, commissioned 52 more f missionaries to serve in the foreign mission field. That couldn't happen without churches gathering together in commitment of partnership. Um, so when you give this morning, a portion of what you, what you give this morning will go to help send people to parts of our world where there are no churches. In fact, many times there, aren't even a, there isn't even a Bible that they could get. If they had a Bible, they would be, it would be confiscated or they'd be put in prison for having that Bible. And so thank you for what you're doing. It's making a difference, not just here in Georgia, but around the world. I want to introduce two people to you. The first one is a, a young man that is serving our country in the military, Reed Wallace. Reed, would you just stand so everybody can kind of say hello to you? He's, st he's stationed at Hunter right now. <laughs> Reed's grandparents uh, were next door to my parents, and uh, they, are, they were members of the church where my father pastored. My father pastored in Augusta, Georgia for 33 years, and then in some other churches in Georgia for a number of other years. Uh, but uh, they were best friends with my family. In fact, his uncle, Ken, was my best friend growing up. And so he's stationed here. He's from Oklahoma, but now he's been here for a year. And so we're glad that he was able to come and just be able to spend some time with him. And my mother is here with me. I went by this morning at 6 o'clock in Augusta and picked her up. And we drove here this morning. We ate at McDonald's, and it was good, all right? Mother, would you stand up so everybody can say hello to you? That's my mother right now. She's still teaching Sunday school in, uh, at Fleming Baptist in Augusta. She's taking a break from that right now because her son said, hey, Mom, let's go together to a wonderful church in the Savannah area. And uh, so she's here. My wife, who was with me and with us last time I was here, she is in Ohio. Our youngest daughter, her husband is finishing up his law degree at Ohio State University. Got one more year. They're up there with the Philistines, all right? So praise the Lord. They'll be uh, finishing up soon. And they're actually moving to another apartment, so she's up there helping them. And so she gives her best wishes and also says she'll be praying for us this morning. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the impact and influence of the Word of God upon our lives. <clears throat> Once again, the impact of the Word of God upon our lives. You understand that our country was built, founded, established on Judeo-Christian values which were really the values that came from the Word of God. You understand our laws, many of them, are based upon what is taught in Scripture. Uh, there, there's so much about our lives that are blessed because of the Word of God, because of the Bible. Uh, it, it affects the way in which you and I treat each other. We just recently had a gentleman that we hired from another part of our country, uh, another part here, and he's serving now. He's been now living in Georgia for a number of months, and I talked to him. I said, what's the difference in Georgia and where you live? He said, well, now, not everybody in Georgia is a Christian, but he said, you can always feel the Christian influence in Georgia. Everywhere I go, there's, there's the Christian influence in Georgia, which makes Georgia a better place to live. It's what a blessing to be here. You, you can live in some places in our country that's not influenced by the Word of God, and I can tell you it's not as good a place to live. Uh, let me read to you what Timothy was told by Paul in Paul's letter to him, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This is not our text, but I'm just going to read this to you. He, Paul told Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, which means what? which means that it was the hand of a man that held the quill or the pen, but it was the hand of God that held the hand, that hand that wrote. In other words, God's Word is the, is the Bible. 
This is God's thoughts. This is what God wants us to understand. This helps us and enables us to learn all kinds of things. In fact, look what he says here. Uh, All Scripture is by inspiration of God. Uh, It is profitable for doctrine. How would you know about heaven without the Bible? You wouldn't. How would you know about hell without the Bible? How would you know about prayer? How would you know about sin? How would you know about forgiveness? How would you know about grace? How would you know about mercy? How would you know about anything speaking in the realm of, the, of our doctrine without the Bible? You wouldn't. He, he said it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Listen to this, for correction. Sometimes people say, you know, I I read the Bible and I feel guilty, so I just sometimes don't read the Bible as much as I should. Listen, that guilt is a very healthy thing. Why? Because when you read the Word of God, which the Bible says it's like a mirror, what does a mirror do? It shows you you. This morning when I got up and I looked in the mirror, and it was early, and I looked in, I went, man, I am getting older every day, all right? There's no trick in the mirror. I don't care what kind of lights you put in there. The Word of God shows you, you. So sometimes that can be painful, but that momentary pain can be a great thing. Why? Because it can bring correction. This word correction is actually a medical term. It's used in the realm of of practice, medical practice, when a, a, a patient, a person has a broken limb, you were to break a leg, you were to break an arm, you know what you have? You have an option. One option is to do nothing. And so what would happen to that limb if you do nothing? It becomes eventually useless. But you have another option, which is what? To go to the doctor and f- for a moment momentary pain, mm, he straightens it and then he sets it so that it might heal correctly for what purpose? That it will become useful, for the, productive for the rest of your life. The Word of God is profitable for correction so that whatever area of your life is lacking or broken, you can see it, you can learn it, you can repent from it, turn from it, and then you could pursue God and have that area set so that it might be productive. And you're like, can I get an amen? amen? I'll ask for them the rest of the service if I have to, all right? Or you can give them freely, all right? Either way. So here's what he said. Doctrine, reprove, correction for instruction in righteousness. Listen to this. That the man of God. Now, he's speaking right now directly to Timothy, but he's also talking to us. That people of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Wow. The Word of God. Now, one of the greatest passages in the Bible about the Bible is Psalm 119. So if you have your Bible, turn with me there. Psalm 119 is one of the most beautiful, poetic works of art in the world. (laughs) Listen, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. It's in the very center of the Bible. If you open up your Bible, you'll see it's there in the center. This chapter is written in eight line or eight verse segments. And throughout the entire chapter, you're going to find eight words that are used over and over again in repetition to talk about the Word. You're going to hear words like God's precepts, God's law, God's testimony, His commandments, His statutes, His judgment, His Word, or His promises. All of those are talking about God's Word. And uh, in all of it, in all of this, 176 verses, all of them but verse 7 really contain a reference to or a direct mention of the Word of God. And all but 14 of them, the writer is writing this to God. It's, it, it, he says things like, it's your Word, God. These are your commands. And so over and over again, when you read this text, if you've never studied Psalm 119, start tomorrow. 
In fact, start today. Because Psalm 119 will teach you the excellencies of the Word of God. Do you know what the least read book in the world is? That's not the Bible, wonderfully. The least read book in the world is uh, the Automobile Owner's Manual. <laughs> Nobody ever says, you know, I'm going to pull that thing out tonight with a cup of coffee and just read about my truck. No, you don't do that. Hey, here's what's amazing. So there is a company or their companies that hire engineers and scientists and, and all kinds of smart men and women. And, and what they do is they design an automobile. This automobile has thousands of parts. And these people who design them, they know every part. They know how the parts fit together because they've made many of those parts. They know how they fit together, how they work, what their purpose is. Because they designed it. And then what they decided to do is let's give the person who buys the truck a book. And in that book it will tell them all of the different parts and, and how they work together. And then it will also tell them, listen to this, how to maintain the automobile so that as they take good care of the automobile, it will perform at maximum productivity. It will help them to prevent breakdowns. So the creator of the automobile gave you a book to help you understand the automobile. The Bible tells us that you and I were created by God. The Bible tells us that while we were in our mother's womb, and trust me, it was a mother who gave birth to you. While you were in your mother's womb, it was the hand of God that wove your parts together. In fact, the scripture says that you are, listen, curiously wrought. Now, we don't talk about that. We don't even speak that way. What that literally means is that you were divinely designed. God made you. God knows every part of you. He knows the intricacies of your personality. He knows your insecurities. He knows the things you feel good about. He knows when you're at peace and when you're not. He knows all these things about you. You know why? He made you. And amazingly enough, the one who made you has given you a book to help you understand you. And more importantly, to help you understand him and to get to know him better. Now watch this. This book not only helps us to understand our purposes, but it also helps us to live life, uh, to maintain what, what we should do and what we shouldn't do, what to be careful of and what to, what to enjoy with all of your passions. He's given us this book of how to live life. And if you and I will read this, it would give us great peace and bring great joy to our hearts. Sadly, we only sometimes <laughs> only bring this out similar to when we bring out the automobile owner's manual. When do we bring out the owner's manual? When something, something goes wrong. Something in your life goes wrong. Get my Bible. Get my, I got to start reading. Man, just think if you would have read before, you might have been able to, um, <laughs> been able to go on a, alleviate it or detour it around those problems. Psalm 119, we're going to look at the second section of this chapter, starting in verse 9. And the, the writer of this incredible chapter starts verse 9 off with a question. Look what the question is. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Listen to this. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin 
against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we bow before you and we declare without hesitancy that we are completely dependent upon you for everything. Why, the next beat of my heart and the next breath that I take, I'm dependent upon you. Speak to us now through your word and through your spirit that we might understand truth, that we might be encouraged and challenged through your word to be more faithful than ever before, that we might live lives that glorify you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So if we could, for just a few moments, I want to just kind of pull out a few of these verses. I'd love to go verse by verse. I don't, listen, we could actually spend an entire day talking about just one of these verses, but we're going to kind of hit them just enough to give us an understanding. All I want to do, seriously, all I want to do is motivate you to get in the Word and stay in the Word. That's all I want to do. I want to, I want to raise your understanding of the importance of the Word of God in your life so that tomorrow morning when you get up and you say, man, I'm running late, but I'll tell you right now, I am never too late or never too busy to be in the Word. Verse 9, the question is asked, how can a young man cleanse his way? The word way there is obviously a reference to a way of life. And now the question is a, about a young man whose way of life needs cleansing or cleaning. Um, it's interesting, we can talk about the pollution problem in America, but I'm going to tell you the greatest pollution problem in America is not in the air, it's not in the water, it's in the hearts and minds of people. It's polluted because of sin. Hebrews talks about these sins that so easily entangle us. And when you dive deeper into this question that the writer here is asking us about the way that we're in, it's actually a word picture of a way of life that shows that a person is stuck. They're caught in a rut, and they can't get out. You see, there's oftentimes when we find ourselves in ruts, uh, we try to get out in our own strength. Maybe you're in a rut at work, or maybe you're in a rut in your marriage, or maybe you're just in a rut in your life, or maybe you're in a spiritual rut going, I'm just not growing, I'm stagnant. Or maybe you're in a rut because you're caught with those sins that so easily entangle you. They looked so exciting at first. They looked oh, like they would bring pleasure and they would bring purpose and fulfillment. And so once you began to engage and participate, you found yourself no longer being set free by this sin, but now you become a captive to it. There's a reason why we call them addictions. Addictions hold you. Talking last night to my nephew who has one of his Dearest friends in the world graduated with him from high school, and he was celebrating that his friend is now 39 days sober, 26 years old. It looks fun. I'm going to do that. Everybody else is doing it. And now you're stuck. So the question is, how can you get out? Well, I can get out with my own strength. Can't I? Listen, <laughs> the flesh will never get you out of what the flesh got you into. What you need is something greater than you, something more powerful than you. Something stronger than you. Because if you could have gotten out of it, you would have a long time ago. There is an enemy in this world that desire, desires, as the Scripture says, to sift you like wheat, to destroy 
you. So when a young man or a young person or a senior adult is stuck in some type of rut, in some type of way that they can't get out of, how can they? Let's see what the Word of God says. Look what he says. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to the Word of God. By taking heed according to your Word. Isn't that amazing? The word take heed means to not only hear it, it means to take, listen, take it from a hearing to a, an experiential. <laughs> As you hear and read and study the Word of God and you now understand the truth or the ways of God, now you begin to apply them to your lives. And when you take heed according to it, it has an effect upon your life. Jesus was speaking to a group in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. This is what he said. If you abide in my word, live in my word, hmm, you are my disciples indeed. Listen, you shall know the truth. How do you know the truth? Because the truth is the Word of God. Who is the truth? Jesus. The Bible says that the Word became flesh. Truth. You abide in His Word, you will know the truth. And what will truth do when you know it? It will set you free. Now this knowing is not, once again, just head knowledge. This is, once again, experiential knowledge. In other words, I'm, it's wisdom. I know it, and now I am living it. You can't get free from the world. This world is dying. It's going away. But you can be set free through the truth of God's Word. How can a young man cleanse his way? How can a young man get out of that mess? You see, the holy hook of the Word of God will grab the front bumper of your life and pull you out of whatever mess you're in. You understand computer people have their own vocabulary and their own terminology, their own... I think they make up stuff just to intimidate us. That's what I do. But sometimes they say things that I understand like this. You ready? Garbage in. That makes sense to me. I'm not the sharpest one. My, listen. But I do understand that if, if, the, if the programmer does something wrong with the program, then it's, the computer can't fix the programmer's error. That's garbage in. And so garbage is going to come out. But I want you to understand something. That, that same principle is true for your life. If you look at things you shouldn't look at on the Internet or on your television or whatever device you, you, you look at, that's garbage in. Let me tell you something, what that will produce is garbage out. If you listen to things you shouldn't listen to, that's garbage. All these entryways into your heart, whether it's your eye, young person, or your ear, or your mind, you allow garbage into your life, it will eventually influence you to allow garbage to come out of your life. The Bible says, can a man take fire to his bosom and not be burned? The answer is absolutely not. So you say, well, I'm a Christian and I, I'm looking at stuff I shouldn't listen to, but I'm still forgiven. No, 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 no. Your heart should be that of desiring the things that God wants. The Scripture says this, God says this to us, be holy as I am holy. You understand, hear me, you understand that your life, what I mean by that is the things that you do, matters. Because it influences the way you think, the way you speak, the way you react. Hear me. More of Jesus, less of me, means a, a better me. Can I get an amen for that? And so as you process through this, garbage in, garbage out, the opposite is true as well, right? If I'm reading the Word of God, whose words are these? Whose thoughts? 
So God's thoughts, God's words, <laughs> his, his, his thoughts are higher, his ways are higher, purer. So righteousness in, what happens? Purity in, come on church. Godliness in. Mm. Friend, you need this to be poured into you every day. But there has to be a commitment on your part. You see, it's one thing to get out of that mess. <laughs> it's another thing to stay out of that mess. As I was growing up as a young boy, sometimes on Saturday nights, if I got cleaned up for church tomorrow, it'd still be outside. It'd still be light outside. I'd say, Mom, can I go outside and play? And she'd say, okay, but stay clean. The odds of that were zero. But this, this is what I'm telling all of us. Stay clean. Here's what the Scripture says. Walk circumspectly. Be on guard. I mean, over and over again in the Bible, it talks about the fact that we're in the midst of an enemy field, an enemy territory. This is, the, this is the, where the prince of the power of the air reigns. And so we now are ambassadors for Christ. We are light and darkness to be shining for him. And we need his orders to do his will. But there needs to be a commitment on our part. Now listen, how does the word of God get into you? When you get into the word, the word gets into you. Amen? Look at this next verse I want you to see. With my whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. So you see right there in the second verse, there is a commitment that's required to be in the Word. There's this cleansing effect of the Word, but it's over here, and if we're not in the Word, we'll never experience it. So what has to happen? You and I have got to make up our mind, I'm going to get in the Word so that the Word can be in me. And so there has to be this commitment of wholeheartedness. Have you ever noticed throughout the Scripture when you read it, over and over again it talks about wholeheartedness. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, you know what, if you are half-hearted, I'm okay with that. God didn't say, you know, you're as good as anybody else. It's never this. In fact, let me read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. It says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God. Listen. And will find him. Here's a two letter word. You ready? You will find him if you seek him with all your heart and all your soul. My wife and I are going to celebrate in July our 35th wedding anniversary. You say, Thomas, you don't look old enough to be, have been married 35 years. I know. My wife's taking good care of me, okay? I'm teasing. I look like I've been married 60. But anyway, here's another thing. What if on our 35th, 35th wedding anniversary night, she and I are out at dinner, a very nice restaurant, and, and I'm, just, I'm just thanking her for 35 years. And just, we're just kind of reminiscing of two girls and all the things that God has blessed us with and and I said to her, I said, Carrie, I want to tell you something. I, I love you. I thank the Lord for you. You've been a blessing to me. You, listen, you have made me better. And I want to tell you, starting right now, for as long as we're married, I want to make you a promise. And she's excited. She's leaning in. And I want to, I want to promise you, from now on, that six days a week, I'm going to be faithful to you. I mean it, honey. I love you. And six days a week, I'm going to be faithful. There's not a person in this room that would take that. Because everybody here knows this. You ready? Almost faithful is unfaithful. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you seeking God with all your 
I'm not asking you to compare yourself to anybody else. It's just you and Jesus. Are you seeking God with all your heart? You see, the Word of God will help you in that process. It will grow you. It will strengthen you. It will correct you. It will feed you. Listen, the Word of God is a lamp for my and a light for my It's milk for the baby. It's meat for the mature believer. The Word of God will guide us, instruct us, enable us, help us to understand. Listen, it will help move our affections from worldly things to spiritual things because it begins to enlighten me and help me, listen, to help me to grow in my understanding of what life is all about. Let's look at the next verse. I want you to see this. There is some incredible protection that's provided by the word. Verse 11 says, your word have I hidden in my heart. Once again, there's the heart. Whole heart seeking him. Now I'm (laughs) hiding the word of God in my heart. For what purpose? Look at this, y'all. Eureka! We've discovered it. How can a man stop sinning? You ready? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So many times people tell me, Thomas, I just don't have time to be in the Word. I, I, listen, we're just so busy. You wouldn't even believe. I just rode by the Effin, Effingham County baseball field. You know what? At 7.30 this morning, there were little bitty 10-year-old boys out there playing baseball. Can I tell you something? There's nothing they're going to learn out there that's going to help them deal with addictions or life or realities or temptation. Nothing. But what's happened is, man, the hearts of our people have been distracted and pulled away from God. People say, I don't have time, man. I'm just so busy. Let me give you something that's going to blow your mind. The average American, and that would be us, the average American spends 1,300 hours each year on social media. Some of you say, well, I don't even know what social media is. Well, it's not you but it's the person sitting next to you, all right? You say 1,300 hours a year. That doesn't sound like a lot. Is that a lot? Well, let me just break it down for you. You ready? That's 54 24-hour days. Let me break it down for you a little bit more. That's one 24-hour day a week that you're losing because you're watching what other people are doing. I tell you that to tell you this. You have time. You just need to prioritize the Word of God in your life. The impact of the Word of God is, he's already said this, thy word have I hidden in my heart. You say, how in the world do you hide the Word of God in your heart? You spend so much time in it, reading it, meditating it, on it. In other words, not just reading it like speed reading, like i got to get this chapter over so I can check in the box. No, no, no. This is instructions. <laughs> Have you ever had to make something at home and, there, and then after you try to make it without the instructions, you go get the instructions like, oh, man, I've been put. I, I remember making some stuff and, and, and looking, and there's like eight screws left over. I'm like, I am in big trouble. Go back and get the instructions. Start reading on. Oh, oh my goodness. If I'd have just read the instructions first, it wouldn't be wonky. Hiding the word of God in your heart or reading the instructions first. Let me start a song and see if y'all can finish it. You ready? Jeremiah was a. Now, isn't it amazing that y'all all knew that? Let me tell you how y'all knew that. You ready? 
Because y'all listen to that song so many times, the words of that song are hidden in your You get it? Let me tell you what you need more than understanding that Jeremiah was a good friend of yours. And he liked to drink his wine. He's a good friend of mine. You need to hide the word of God in your heart. In those moments in which you're tempted, if all you've got are the lyrics of a rock and roll song, you're not going to have much to fight with, are you? Can I get an amen? But if you've got the word of God hidden in your heart and the Holy Spirit will give you recall in the moment in which you're tempted, you will be able to say no to Satan, no to the world, no to the flesh. You remember Jesus when he was in the wilderness preparing for his messianic ministry? He's there fasting and preparing and praying. And the scripture says that every day Satan came and tempted him. We only have three of those encounters recorded for us in scripture. But the Bible tells us every day Satan came and tempted him, trying to detour him away from what God the Father wanted God the Son to do. And every time Satan tempted Satan, Satan tempted Jesus, what did Jesus use to fight with? He quoted to him the word of God every time. You understand the armor of God that we're given, it's in Paul's writings, that we have the helmet, I mean the helmet, we have the breastplate, we have all these different things, the, 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 the sandals, the belt of truth. But there's only one offensive weapon in the armor that we're given. What is that? It's the sword of the word that helps us fight the enemy and helps us not to engage the flesh, the world, and the devil in our own pleasures. I'm going to close with this one thing I want to share with you about. We're going to move quickly to the very end. There has to be this incredible adoration that you have for the Lord. If you don't love the Word of God, you're not going to be in it. And I can tell you something. If you don't love the Word of God, you're not in it. But if you get in it, you will adore it. You, you will cherish it. Look now at verse 14. He says, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. He's saying right there, I love God's word more than everything I own. Now you say, well, who was this guy? He was the king. If I were to tell you I love the Bible more than anything I own, you say, well, you're just a Baptist preacher. You ain't got anything. And I'd say, you're right. The king is telling you this. I love the word of God. More than all riches. You know what the Bible asks us this question. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So, Thomas, if I want to start reading the Bible, and I haven't done it for a while, where would I start? I'm so glad you asked that. If I were you, I'd start in the Gospel of John. Right now, I just finished 2 Corinthians. I just finished it. Now I'm headed into Galatians. I'm, I'm, I'm in chapter 4 now in Galatians in my own personal study. But I'm going to go back and read it for a couple more weeks. Why? There's just too much there for me to get. I'm just not that sharp. So sometimes I read 20 verses. Sometimes I read 30. I'm not, listen, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to beat you or race you. I'm just trying to get it. And so I, sometimes I'll read 10 verses like four times going, Lord, teach me all that I need to know. It's amazing. The next day I read it, I, I learn something else from the same text. So starting the Gospel of John, there's a lot of things you probably won't understand when you start reading it. But don't worry about it. Because there'll be enough there that you do to keep you busy for the rest of your life. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. Jump in the Word. Jump in tomorrow. Amen.
Let me tell you one of the things that the Word of God tells us. The Bible tells us so clearly that all of us, all of us are in the same condition. No matter where you're from in this world, no matter what your educational level, your income, <laughs> no, ma no matter what your ethnicity, none of those things listen, matter in regard to this. You ready? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Here's another verse that talks about all of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of God is God's desire for every one of us. But you know what sin does? It causes us to miss the mark. That's what it actually means. In other words, we're, we're aiming for something wonderful in our lives, but sin causes us to fall short or miss what life's all about. And so what God did, who is going to judge the world, but God is also, listen, infinite love. And he's provided a way by which you and I can have our sin forgiven. Think about that. And this forgiveness is not just an overlooking of it. No, it's a removal of it from your record. The scripture says that we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us as if we've never sinned. The only way to have a relationship with God is through his son Jesus who died on the cross to pay your sin debt and mine that we now can be declared righteous, sin debt paid, now forgiven, and now we can have a relationship with God. You say, I don't even know where to begin. Well, let me tell you where you begin, by placing your faith in Jesus. I, you say, I don't have much faith. You know what? Jesus will give you more if you ask him. You know what we do when we respond to light? God shines more light down upon us. Your heart's desire is to know God and to pursue him. He will pursue you. So you're ready to give your life to Jesus. Wonderful. Let's bow our heads together. You're here this morning say, Thomas, I want to be in the word more than I ever have. Why don't you make that commitment right now? Why don't you just say, Lord, right now, <laughs> I commit tomorrow morning I'm going to be in John 1. I may read six verses. I may read six, 66. But tomorrow, Lord, I make a commitment. I will be in the word. Wonderful. Father, may the word be in us and us in the word. Maybe this morning you're saying, Thomas, I know I need Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I want him to be Lord of my life. I need to be saved. Fantastic. The Bible says that if you want that, you must ask for it and ask for it in faith. The Bible says, seek and you'll find. You say, I'm ready right now. What do I need to do? Well, then pray. Ask. Well, I don't know what words to say. Well, let me, let me help you with that. In the privacy of where you're seated right now, you say, I'm ready to surrender my everything, my all, to all of God. <laughs> well, then pray this with me. Pray it silently in your heart, knowing that God's listening to every thought you think. Pray this. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And right now, I place my faith in you. Not me, not religion, in you. And I ask you to come into my life and take control. I acknowledge you now as my Lord. And I declare that I am yours and you are mine. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and help me to live for you every day. Now, as we're seated in, in, a, in a position of prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it with all your heart, then I want to pray for you right now. But I'd love to know who you are. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but it's, the privacy of where you're seated, you say, I prayed that prayer with you, Thomas, and I meant it with all my heart. Would you let me know right now by just quietly lifting up your hand? Just raise it up as high as you can. Say, I prayed that with you, Thomas, and I meant it. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? In just a moment, I'm going to say a word of prayer. When I say amen, we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to begin to sing together.
And this is an invitation. I'll be down front here. There'll be others here. If you want to come to the altar and pray, please do that. If you're looking for a church home, this will be a great church if God's leading you here. But if you also prayed that prayer with me and you meant it with all your heart, I'll be here to talk with you, to help you in your next steps in your brand new life with Christ. I'll pray. We'll stand and sing and you come. Father, in Jesus' name, may your will be done in our lives. May we submit, surrender, yield everything that needs so that you can be in complete control. What a different world and different life it would be if you were in complete control. So right now, our heart's desire is to seek you with all our heart. And may you be glorified. And I pray this in Christ. Amen.